Not every system needs to be developed using microservices architecture. Oftentimes, you'd be better served creating a monolith. Specifically, a monolith driven by asynchronous messaging and strict boundaries. Here's how I do it. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design and in .NET. So if you're interested in those topics, make sure to subscribe. So regardless of whether we're talking about microservices, SOA, or monoliths, I think the key point here is having boundaries. So I'm using the term bounded context that comes from domain-driven design, but regardless of whether you uh, have read the book or understand what a bounded context is, really for me, it's about defining boundaries of a particular part of the system. So what are the boundaries? Well, the boundaries really are, what does that piece of the system actually do? What are its capabilities? Uh, what are its business capabilities? And what does it actually provide? It's going to be the ownership, the owner of those capabilities and the data behind it. So that essentially to me is what a, whether you want to call it a bounded context, whether you want to use the term service, again, it's about capabilities. When you kind of dive into what this boundary contains, it's going to contain a project for contracts, a project for implementation and a project for your tests. In any large system, you're not going to have just one bounded context. You're likely going to be having um, a variety of them. How many is depending on how big your system is and how much you define these boundaries. But the idea here is that you're going to have implementation reference other contracts, but no other implementation is going to reference another implementation. So if we think about having contracts, implementation, and tests, obviously you know what the test project is going to be. It's just the test for your implementation. But your contracts are going to be things like interfaces, delegates, and just simple DTOs that are going to represent most likely events that you're going to be emitting from that bounded context that other uh, bounded contexts are going to act upon. So another key point here is that each boundary is going to have its own data store, its own database. There is no sharing databases or entity framework contexts between these. Their boundaries are their boundaries. Your implementation of your, if you're using entity framework or whatever you're using as a data access library, that's actually gonna live in the implementation and that's not gonna be shared. So each uh, boundary, each bounded context is gonna have its own database context and its own underlying database. So one of the two top level pieces can be something like ASP.NET Core. So this is gonna be your HTTP API using ASP.NET Core and Kestrel. And the way this works is that it is going to be the one that will reference all the implementation and all the contracts projects. It essentially is doing the composition of rolling everything out so it can serve all the different routes, controllers, what have you that you've implemented in each implementation project. So as a request comes in, it hits the HTTP server and then ultimately in process is directing the traffic to the right implementation, i.e. the right assembly. So when I mentioned messages in the contracts project, this is why. If a request comes in from the HTTP server and something occurs within one of the boundaries, one of the bounded contacts, and you need to let other parts of the system know that something occurred, what you're gonna be doing then is creating a new instance of a message, again, a DTO that lives in the contracts project, and that's gonna be published to a message broker. So the second top level piece here, living alongside the HTTP server, as a console app or a Windows service or a Linux service, whatever the case may be, it's gonna be the one communicating with the message broker, getting messages from the message broker, and then ultimately dispatching those to the relevant implementation in whatever bounded context. So if a message is published from the HTTP server, hits the broker, the message processor picks it up, and then delegates that and dispatches it to other parts of the system. Now, once a message has been received or an event has been received from another part of the system, it can be doing the same thing and publishing messages back to the message broker and then kind of the cycle continues. What that looks like in terms of flows, let's say there's an HTTP request that comes in and hits ASP.NET Core. In process, it's gonna use one of the implementation projects for whatever route it needed. And let's see the implementation then makes some state change to a database. If there's something that needs to let another part of the system know what's gonna happen, is it's gonna then that implementation is gonna create a message and publish that to a message broker. Then from there, what's gonna happen is the message processor, a completely different process, is gonna be picking that message up from the broker and dispatching it to whatever other context, one or more or none, that need to be notified and handle that particular message. 
The benefit with this approach is you're ultimately creating tight boundaries, but you're hosting everything together, ultimately at the top level, actual executables, the HTTP server and the message processor. So you get the benefits of things like you'd be doing with SOA or microservices where you're commuting asynchronously and you get that loose coupling because you're not doing any RPC directly. But again, you're having everything host uh, in the same code base. So things like refactoring become easier because if you want to, for example, change how a event is defined in your contracts, you can do a find all references and you get the benefit of having everything in a single solution in a single code base. Now there are downsides to this. And the primary one is the, the downside of a monolith is that you, when you're deploying, you're deploying everything together. So if you've made changes in one bounded context and you made changes in another bounded context and you do your deployment, you have the risk of taking down the entire system. But that's not necessarily an issue with this particular strategy of a loosely coupled monolith. That's just monoliths in general. And that's generally why, along with the size of your team and your organization, why people prefer to go with the microservices route is because of the deployment possibilities. It's one of the reasons anyways. But you're kind of forced into some of these um, microservices or SOA architectures depending on your team size. I found this, what I'm describing today, very useful for small teams that are developing big systems. You don't have to go into the, the complexity of all the deployment of all these different services. Again, you can, even what I mentioned, the, the kind of the downside of kind of that single deployment, there's strategies and ways around this with kind of rolling deployments or only deploying to a segment of your, uh, your farm or what's on, underneath your load balancer. So there's kind of ways around it. If you're using a similar type of approach, let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in more details about the actual implementation or actual project structure or solution structure uh, in Visual Studio or in Rider and how that looks, again, let me know in the comments. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more software architecture related videos.